Our next speaker comes all the way from Australia. La la. Uh, she's the author of more than 40 beloved books, uh, including her newest, Baby Bedtime. Uh, she is Australia's most loved children's book author. Please welcome Mem Fox. That's better. <laughs> I'll just do it backwards. Um, <laughs> I noticed that where my editor was supposed to sit, the seat is empty, and I know absolutely why. Because when Alan Johnston loses her phone, she ceases to exist. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know, AJ, wherever you are, she's there, oh, she's there, that Kate DeMillo had your phone. But I see that you have reincarnated, that's fantastic. <laughs> Excellent, okay. Seriously, I can't see this. Um, I don't need to see it. I, I, I do know what I'm about to say. I had one of those hideous old age experiences a couple of weeks ago. I was in a drugstore in Australia buying sleeping pills to take me through the long journey from my hometown to New York. The woman who sold me the sleeping pills made a joke about the dangers of taking drugs to the USA. <laughs> so she and I got on very well. We had a bit of a laugh. She was lovely. I liked her a lot until she handed over the sleeping pills and said very kindly, I'll give you a senior's discount on that. <laughs> senior's discount? Was it that obvious that I was a senior? And if it was that obvious, didn't she know that baby boomers are never going to be seniors? We are never, ever going to be senior citizens. We are young forever. <laughs> However, I did forgive her because I realized that if I were not of seniors discount age, I would not be old enough to be a grandmother and if I had not become a grandmother, I would not have written Baby Bedtime. And if I had not written Baby Bedtime, I would not be in a drugstore buying sleeping pills <laughs> to go to New York to speak about Baby Bedtime at BEA. <laughs> so thank you, BEA, for your invitation very much. Thank you very much. I am so honored and thrilled to be here. I cannot tell you. And to Simon and Schuster, thank you so much for bringing me here. Okay, now I can put on my glasses. I had to learn that off by heart. But now that you know how old I am, I can put my glasses on. Okay. At the beginning of 2010, I had never been a grandmother. Our only child, Chloe, was almost 39 before she deigned to provide my husband and me with a grandchild, a grandson. By then, most of our friends had been grandparents for years. They had tried to explain, and you do not want to talk to a grandparent, they're the most nauseating tribe on earth. Uh, <laughs> they had tried to explain the sublime difference between, a pet, between being a parent and being a grandparent, which I had dismissed as the biased ravings of the besotted. Then, rather too quickly, I became a grandmother myself. Theo, our grandson, was born 10 weeks premature. He weighed two pounds. He was in a humid crib in a neonatal ward for the first two and a half months of his life. Now, no premature baby looks lovely. They're as ugly as sin, to tell you the truth. They look like wizened little monkeys. But to those whose grandchild it is, that tiny mite is as perfect and as exquisite as the most beautiful baby ever born since the beginning of time. On one occasion, I was so overwhelmed by the love I felt for Theo that I had to cling to his humid crib to steady myself. I read to him daily. 
I talked to him daily. I sang to him daily. One day, I noticed that his ears didn't stick out. Mine do. <laughs> Focus on the jacket, people. Focus on the jacket. I was so happy for him. I mean, he's a boy after all, and his ears don't stick out. I loved his ears. I loved his nose. I loved his fingers, his toes. The whole of him, like the wild things. I, I wanted to eat him up. I loved him so. I opened one of the little round windows beside his ear in the humid crib, and I whispered to him, I could eat your little ears. I could nibble on your nose. I could munch your tiny fingers. I could gobble up your toes. I realized I'd accidentally composed the beginning of a love poem for a baby. <laughs> so I said it to him without, you know, I didn't have a pen and paper, obviously. I said it to him again and again and again, hoping that I wouldn't forget the words, and also hoping that the sound of my voice and the sentiments that I was speaking would make him know that he would be loved and safe with me for the rest of his life. The rest of his family is irrelevant. He would be safe. <laughs> he would be safe with me. I finished the poem over the next couple of days. And I know this will sound absurd, so please don't tell anybody. I, I handwrite all my first drafts, and then I move to the computer after that. Because I'm a baby boomer, my brain doesn't work without a pencil and paper. So as I was writing this poem, I, I caught myself leaning forward over the desk so that the love could more nearly flow from my heart onto the paper. I actually went like that so that the love could go onto the paper. Eventually, those verses became the book that is on your tables. Now, as you well know, I am drawn to bedtime themes. Perhaps it's because bedtime is such a loving interlude for a parent and a child. The time we most often associate with reading picture books to our snuggled-in sweethearts. The flip side of bedtime is that it can also be an absolutely ghastly battle to calm fractious, weary, horrible children <laughs> and get them to sleep, which is why I try so hard to write with quiet rhythm and soothing repetition for children's sakes as well as for their parents, <laughs> for whom literary hypnosis <laughs> is a nightly godsend. As you may also know, I'm absolutely passionate about children being read to from the day they're born. Baby bedtime being, of course, the perfect choice. So I try desperately hard to shape my stories for read aloud perfection. A few weeks ago, when my editor, who has come back into being because she's clearly found her phone, um, a few weeks ago, my editor, Alan Johnston, and I were working intensively in my house together in Australia. And in that week that she was with me, I wrote over 30 drafts in five days for a new story that will end up being only two pages of typing. In the end, perhaps 450 words maximum. It may be years before I'm completely happy with this text, and even longer before AJ finally lays down her whip. I don't mind her whip. I welcome it. I rarely reject her suggestions because I know that little kids are very, very smart. And they recognize good writing a mile off, and they want to engage with it immediately. They want it read over and over and over and over and over again, much to the hair-tearing despair of their parents. But it's this over and overness, the happy familiarity with the story, that helps launch children into literacy and a lifetime love of reading. Thank you heaven for picture books. They make children into the readers that we all want into the in the world. And thank heaven for the publishers 
who are still willing and able to publish them. So kisses to Beach Lane Books and AJ for publishing this one. I'm going to read you Baby Bedtime. You may want to follow along or you may just want to listen to my voice. I let you choose. Here we are. The illustrations are by Emma Quay. Quay, not Key. Don't ask me why, but Quay is the way to pronounce her name. I could eat your little ears. I could nibble on your nose. I could munch your tiny fingers. I could gobble up your toes. I could rock you in my arms. I could gaze at you all night. I could whisper lots of stories till the darkness turns to light. I could stroke your silky hair. I could sit you on my knee. I could sing you all the songs that my mother sang to me. I could listen to you breathing. I could pat your precious head. I could hold your hand in my hand as I sit beside your bed. But there comes a time for sleeping and our sleepy time is now. So fall asleep, my angel, with a kiss upon your brow. In 1946, the year I was born, the first year of the baby boomer generation. In 1946, after they had published Benjamin Spock's wildly successful Baby and Child Care, Simon and Schuster wondered if they could have similar success with children's books as they'd had such success with books about children. One of the directors said, how about hitching our wagon to the stalk Little Golden Books appeared very soon after that, creating rivers of gold for the company and for its authors. Hitching my wagon to the stalk has been the story of my writing life, and it's probably because of moments like this. I was at my daughter's house one evening recently when Theo wouldn't go to sleep. He had already had four stories read to him, but now the lights were out and he was lively with exhaustion. Chloe was lying on his bed trying to soothe him. He called out to me to please come into the room. I obeyed. I knelt beside his bed and listened to him breathing. I held his hand in my hand. I stroked his silky head and then very quietly, in the dark, my daughter began to sing. It was a song I had sung to her 40 years before. It was a song my mother had sung to me. My own dear mother, long gone. But all at once and without any warning, alive again in a lullaby. I wanted to howl like a wolf at the moon. So many songs, so many bedtimes, so many memories. I hid my face to hide my weeping. And Theo fell asleep. 